Dr. Bruce squeezing in this May 2018 Levity Zone episode as I prepare for a great adventure to Middle Earth next month, as yours truly heads to New Zealand. There I will give astrobiology talks all over the North Island, Auckland at a conference in Rotorua, and Wellington, and engage in our origin of life experiments in the famous hot springs on the sovereign lands of the Maori. We are going to attempt to polymerize RNA in ancient earth analog conditions out in the field. Last year at this time, I was in Yellowstone National Park, and we just published a new paper showing that we could form vesicles in hot spring waters at a range of pHs from acidic to alkaline. On this trip, I am really visiting Middle Earth with a stopover at Weta Studio in Wellington to meet with Sir Richard Taylor and his world-class team of model builders, costumers, and computer animators. If you don't know Weta, they created the Lord of the Rings trilogy and many more breathtaking films such as the recent Blade Runner 2049. So what do we have for you this month? Something very special. A conversation with a gentleman who some think of as anti-science, and woo-woo, but for others are deeply grateful for introducing them to meditation and healthy lifestyles, Deepak Chopra. I have to admit I was a Deepak skeptic after watching his YouTube encounters with Richard Dawkins, Caltech physics students, and many others. However, when I met him briefly after my talk at the Science and Non-Duality Conference in October 2017, we both felt a connection. One thing you should know about Dr. Bruce is that he values connection highly, often over differences in personal ideology or other points of view. I believe strongly that if communication channels are open and there is trust, much can be accomplished in the world, especially between those who are otherwise diametrically opposed. So after Deepak and my brief encounter, we committed to getting together for a more extensive conversation. That opportunity came at the Science of Consciousness Conference just last month in April of 2018, held at a beautiful resort in Tucson, Arizona, surrounded by saguaro and barrel cactuses. This was the second time I had presented to this meeting of neuroscientists, meditators, psychedelicists, and other consciousness explorers. As Deepak was also there, we agreed to meet in his room and record a Facebook Live session. I was new to this medium and was amazed as Deepak simply set up his phone next to his laptop and 22,000 people were already there waiting. From that point, it flowed beautifully into a discussion of science on the origin of life, the oldest rocks containing clear evidence for life, the future of life, and the subject of emergence in general. Deepak expressed clear enthusiasm, showing the rock and the Scientific American cover article to his audience, and listened respectfully as I did most of the explaining. So it also seemed for his fans online as copious hearts and thumbs were flowing up in streams in the video channel. For a moment I dropped into what my personal presence practice calls open-hearted awareness and brought up the subject of healing to see if Deepak wanted to go toward that presumably familiar territory for him. Surprisingly, or not, he really wanted to focus on the science. So rather than an anti-science bias, I found that in fact deep in Deepak was a desire to connect to this part of the human enterprise. After the broadcast ended, we agreed that it wouldn't be the last time we met and planned for future dialogues. For this stream, there were hundreds of shares and over 600 comments, and I learned that day what a powerful medium the internet and social media can be to reach an audience. At one point, I paid him a compliment for how well he greeted the lines of people after his morning meditation, to which Deepak replied, I love connection. Hello, my friends. Today is a busy day, so... Uh, lots of Facebook lives, but uh, remember today is the um, 
uh, second anniversary of Facebook Live, April 6th. Hmm. And I've been here almost every day for the last two years. I want to thank uh, Cheryl Sandberg and Shannon Mattingly and uh, Kalia Gray for immense support. And uh, thank you for being here every day. Uh, we've expanded this conversation. As you know, I'm obsessed with consciousness and I get uh, to speak to some great people here. And I'm right now in Tucson, Arizona, and uh, we are at the Science of Consciousness um, meetings, conferences. I had the pleasure of listening to my very special guest, Bruce, say hi to all these people. They're sending you messages and hearts yeah. and likes. So nice. Bruce Damer was at a conference called Science and Non-Duality. He spoke about the origins of life and consciousness uh, there and over here as well. And I thought, why not expose him to all of you who are all over the world watching us right now. So thanks for joining me, Bruce. Thank you, Deepak. Thank you. So let's start with a little bit about your background. What is your background? I'm Canadian. Yes. You know? uh, came to the U.S., did a Ph.D. in various computational things, uh -huh. wrote some of the first graphical interfaces on PCs in the 80s. I see. Um, then I started doing virtual worlds, like avatars, mm. not avatars mm. from your culture, but avatars in cyberspace. Mm -hmm. And then I started doing work for NASA, mission mm. designs, simulations, asteroid missions, human landers, things like that, and Mars program. And then I got to my dream that I had in, when I was 14, which is to work on the origin of life. Mm -hmm. So in four, when I was 14, I had a thought experiment, I had a vision, mm -hmm. kind of like the visions you have. Mm -hmm. uh, of the first self-assembling molecules. And I questioned them, but then they questioned me on how to figure out how they made co a copy of themselves. And they challenged me when I was 14. So these were spontaneous visions? The spontaneous visions. No uh, hallucinogens or no, no. Just spontaneous. Yeah, just intention. Just uh, Self-assembling molecules, you mean DNA? I don't know. They were very diffuse. Mm -hmm. Um it, I had just read a, a, an article about Albert Einstein, mm -hmm. how he had these beautiful visions of running alongside beams of light That's when he right. was 16, and then watching the compression and everything, and it led to special relativity. So I thought okay. that's how science was done. Yeah. Science, by the way, I mean, it's interesting that we call this the science of consciousness. Um, we used to call it toward science of consciousness. Right. But science is in consciousness, right? Yeah. Well, all the scientific modeling yeah. is done in consciousness. Yeah. And, and, should... and if, you, if, you, if your instrument is not tuned, it's not wide enough, mm -hmm. this is why I really connect in with some of your thinking. Mm -hmm. Because you're trying to stretch, like the meditation you did this morning, mm -hmm. allowed me to stretch my consciousness, to create the observer, and then dissolve the observer. It was just really wonderful. And then... The this, this most special thing for me was the little the little delay mm -hmm. in who am mm -hmm. I? Who yeah. am I? Because that gives us access mm -hmm. to the big field. Mm -hmm. And it, that was just a beautiful well, thank you. technique. Thank but you. let's now talk about your work. <laughs> Let us all be educated on what your theories are about the origins of life and consciousness. Well, I can start with, start with where it ended up. Mm -hmm. We can hold this up for the, the viewers. You can hold it up. So this is Scientific American, the great eclipse of 2017. The issue is called The New Origins of Life. Did volcanic hot springs harbor the first living organism? So a long time I read that the first mm -hmm. living organisms yeah, were nice. called... Uh, the first living organisms were called chemolitho autotrophic hyperthermophiles, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> these, yeah. Yeah. These microorganisms on the so, rims of volcanoes. Yeah, so here's the actual model. Everybody can see that. And I can send it out. And this is the seven stages to the origin of life, starting with what Deepak just said, ending up in the, the cycling pool generates those chemical feeding simple protocells. There they are, going through wet, dry, and moist cycles like a bathtub filling and drying. And we do this in the lab now, 
It's empirical. It works. Mm -hmm. So we grow polymers mm -hmm. without enzymes, right? So it's nature's way of creating random polymers to then select from, like mm -hmm. a random sequence library, is to dry things down until they click together, click, 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 click. Mm -hmm. Water leaves, and then you form RNA, even DNA, and peptides. And if you have a lick, if you have like a soapy kind of uh, fatty acid lipid in there, which is mm -hmm. what we're made of, we're bags of lipid. You know, lipid health is is a big deal, right? In body health, mm -hmm. um, they they form these membranes that sort of go down to the bottom of the pool, and then they stack everything together between layers mm -hmm. in a liquid crystal, and then that starts to sort of move around. Water leaves, and you get these fantastic libraries of polymers. So all this was self-organizing. Self-organizing. Self-organizing, also self-regulating in a way, self-correcting yeah. yeah. in a way. Driven right. by the big cycle. This is why mm -hmm. I brought this this door mm -hmm. Driven by the big cycling system, which is the turning of the planet into the sun, and then going into the dark. So it's does like, everyone know what a dorja is? A dorja is a Tibetan uh, instrument uh, that's used as a vehicle for meditation. Yes, yeah. And so uh, you're seeing a connection between this symbol yeah. and the self-organizing principles I, and I, in, yeah, uh, in yeah. the cosmos. Yeah, like uh, Fritzhoff Kopra, when, yeah. when he uh, saw the, the Tao in the spinning particles. Remember mm -hmm. in his yeah. book, yeah, yeah. I see this... Uh -huh in the cycling upon cycling upon cycling, we're actually seeing chemically. And when I do my thought experiments out into when cells get more compl com complicated and then learn to divide. So that's what I'm working on now, is the path from the simplest little protocell to the dividing living cell. So all the way from those microorganisms, the chemolitho autotrophic yes. hypothermophiles to <laughs> homo sapiens, yeah. um, I'm going to ask you something very controversial. Mm. With everything that you've learned about uh, cosmic evolution, because it is cosmic evolution, It's a right? piece of it, yeah. yeah. And everything then that's followed since then, biological evolution. How, uh, how uh, and this is a hot kind of controversial question, mm. how wedded are you to the conventional model of... Uh, random mutations and natural selection that is now basically the Bible mm -hmm. of science. Mm -hmm. I live in two magisteria, you know, the, the term, the, the mm -hmm. dual magisteria. I live in both. Mm -hmm. And Deepak, what I try to do is I, I try to walk the liminal ridge mm -hmm. between these magisteria. So part of my practice is going down into the pure mechanical reductionist world because I'm a gearhead. You know, as a kid, I was. Sure. I want to find solutions that work, and you know, I wrote a lot of software and everything. But I realized that you you can't <clears throat> you can't solve the big problems without going into the magic, the magisteria of magic, and and then connecting with the field, mm -hmm. this large field, which is where you are. This is where you dwell, mm -hmm. and where your inquiry is. So, but our reductionist inquiry is a modeling. Mm -hmm. of a mode of knowing and experience in human consciousness. Would you agree? Uh, it's a modeling. I, I think it's a, it's, it's a dance. Because mm. one of the... I asked a question once, how is reality created? Mm. And the voice came back. You can appreciate this. I was bumped in the leg. Mm. And the voice came to me, get up, stop thinking, and start moving. And as soon as I, I, I went into a dance, I went into a circular dance. And the answer was, you can't know it, but you can become it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in some sense, that was a, the perfect marriage of the two magisteria. Being and becoming. Being and becoming by moving. Because mm -hmm. the answer to my inquiry on what makes the cosmos was a continuous cycling beautiful system and everything so when I was doing the dance when I was spinning everything was spinning it was very much like uh, like Fritz of Capra mm -hmm. you know uh, but with my body so as my body spun, fa spun faster and faster I had more and more becoming not necessarily knowing but absolutely every cell becoming yeah 
that's the Sufi way of uh, transcending mm. uh, what we call separation in a way. Yeah. Right? The Sufis dance till they go into this ecstatic yeah, state where separation, well, separation is the great is tragedy yeah. of what's well, the great tragedy of our world. Yeah. The We're separation. just facing all the suffering in the world right oh, now. It's terrible. So you have this uh, that other piece of uh, rock yeah, that you, you can showed maybe me. share with them. So what is this, Bruce? This is uh, ground evidence of our oldest ancestors. So if you see these beautiful little ridges here, see it there? Those ridges are stromatolites. They're laid down by microbial mats over three billion years ago. And this was picked up on our field season in northwest Australia, which is a is a little surviving piece of the Archean crust, the oldest 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 intact crust. And our colleagues discovered uh, evidence for a hot spring there in Australia. Yeah, three three point five billion year old hot spring in Australia, and that's the subject of. So the Scientific American article has our complete cycling model and landscape. You can find this online, I'm sure, this uh, yeah. issue, right? Which issue? Of course? It's the August issue, and there's the there's the hot spring stromatolite, and that circular little contusion, that's possibly an air bubble, oxygen bubble, the breath of life. That's, that's the earliest evidence, potentially, of oxygen production by biofilms in the oldest evidence on, on Earth. So that's the breath of, of life. It's putting the oxygen in to the atmosphere and to the ocean so that it rusts all this iron out. So Deepak is holding something that's quite heavy and massive. Very heavy. It's yeah, full it's of heavy. iron. Full of iron. Mm -hmm. And and that iron has to be oxidized out for three billion years before we can get breathable air. And that iron was originally in the crucible of a burning star, a yeah. supernova. Yeah. And that iron is right now in your hemoglo uh, hemoglobin going to your brain so you can enjoy this conversation. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of the unbelievable yeah. inseparability of existence. Yeah. Uh, are yeah. we stardust beings having a human experience? Or or are or 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 are we human beings having the experience of the universe? Or are we the sentience in which uh, all forms of knowing occur in every species of consciousness. Mm. And I'll add one more, because those are beautiful. Mm. I find that in meditative states, I can achieve that union mm. if I do the following. If I drop my consciousness, my mind, drop it down. Mm. Like this. And then I go out. Now I open Expand. my awareness. Expand, yeah. And then with a heart, open-hearted awareness, an open heart. And then turn around and back. And there's just a little, little yeah, we come in. Union. Mm -hmm. Union. Unity consciousness a wholeness starts to emerge. Mm -hmm. And as we train ourselves in these practices, that, that wholeness, I think, just starts expanding. Mm -hmm. In a room full of people, as you know, that when that unity, when that wholeness starts to grow, everyone is like, oh, it just sweeps yeah. them up. Yes. Because the group is the thing nowadays, yes. right? It, yeah. Group energy, group field, mm -hmm. which is what you've done for decades. But I'm in an energy healing program or practice now, so I'm learning all these skills to mm -hmm. heal childhood trauma, for mm -hmm. example. That's what we're focused on, mm -hmm. the seven or eight character styles of trauma. Sure. Yeah. Which is a huge... Actually, yeah. it ultimately is all the suffering in the world. It, it goes is. back to childhood, right? It does, yeah. Yeah. Like my suffering in my childhood, mm -hmm. I found it. It took half my lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, I was adopted at birth, mm -hmm. and through practices, intense practices, I was able to relive my conception all the way and feel my mother's love in her in her womb for the first time because I was given up. Mm -hmm. I never felt a mother's love. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And at four months, so I'm growing. I'm a thing. I'm an em I'm embryonic. 
and in utero. And then through this practice, this very deep practice, I heard a whispering and I looked out into the night and I saw an outline of two people and it was my parents giving me up. I didn't understand the whispers, but then the love connection went away. Oh, it was intense. It's amazing to me that you can straddle these two worlds, the the world of uh, the mystical mystery, the majesty of the mystery, and then break it down to the reductionist world of science. I'm trying, Deepak, I'm trying to do it. So where is consciousness? Does consciousness have an origin, or is it the ontological primitive in um, which evolution takes place? If we believe in history and time, and we project back, if we believe that history is real and there isn't, is there something other than the present, we can create all kinds of models. Which is what we're doing. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. So, if we set ourselves in, in the now, mm-hmm. you know, our, our fellows tell us that we should, mm-hmm. uh, there's just this. All experiences now. All experiences now. But when I touch this, mm-hmm. when I touch this, millions of years old. Yeah, something is coming through this. Mm-hmm. So what I decided to do, and this is what I did in the, in the talk yesterday, I said, what if you know, the practice that I had done, where I went into open-hearted awareness and then awareness, consciousness, becoming conscious of itself. So I think only consciousness can know itself. That's right. And this is where a lot of the speakers are off, because they go into abstract thought, and then even more abstract thought, and point it back at consciousness. But their abstract thought is too far too simple to address consciousness. So unless they're coming from a fully embodied conscious state, and then asking from that state, they're disconnected, they're, they're dissociated from the question itself. The mystery deepens though, you know, the more you know scientifically, Mm. the more kind of mysterious it gets. Uh, Matter, for example, uh, which is very real, right? This is real experience, it's heavy, it's heavy, uh, it's hard, but um, it's an experience too, and the experience is very ephemeral, it's a sensation in consciousness reified as the world. As soon as you give a name to an experience, you create the notion of an objective world. Right, right? precisely. Just giving name. But this as a rock is a solid piece of matter. Yeah. As a process, it's all the quantum stuff, you know. Yeah. And then it's probability waves yeah. in a, a huge void. So I can show you a practice I do yeah. with this. So if I do this, so when when I was given up uh, in utero, hmm. what I think happened, I mean, you could give me an analysis, hmm. my consciousness started looking for love. Hmm. The love dropped, hmm. and it started seeking. Everywhere. Yes. Everywhere. And it learned how to realm, hmm. how to travel. And so when I came out, I was two things. I was a capsule, because I had to build a capsule protection around hmm. myself, but I was an inquiry, too. Mm-hmm. So in the crib, I remember going out of the hospital, spiraling out and up to the limb of the earth when I was in the adoption ward. That came back. And it's like, so I had a realming mind, but a very closed container. Mm-hmm. So I was practically autistic. So when my adoptive parents took me home, I was like, my mother said, he's in his own world. Yeah. But this is the 60s, and they don't even have a diagnosis for, for mm-hmm. autism at the time. So luckily for me, I didn't get treated as a patient. Mm-hmm. So all through my life, I had to break out of that egg. But my consciousness was already traveling everywhere. Yeah, I would think, actually, as I'm listening to you, I think of Stephen Hawking, who was kind of locked into yeah. his body, yeah. couldn't even move uh, his eyelids, had to work through a computer, mm. yet his consciousness was uh, wow. accessing black holes and yeah. singularity. Yeah, amazing. And space-time <laughs> that, did, you see, and did you see that Cambridge video yeah. Yeah. Of, on his death where they show him in the wheelchair traveling That's through right. the cosmos? Through the cosmos. Was, that's such a beautiful... Yeah, but your experience sounds so similar. So what I do with this, so I hold this and mm. feel the weight of it. 
And then I let my consciousness go back to the Hadean or the Archean, into the pools where this arose. And a heart connection, I feel those progenians, the progenos, the earliest, most fragile Buddha. And I feel hope for them because it's difficult. They're, they're, because they're rising and failing. It's the time of hungry ghosts. Progeno colonies would start and fail, come almost into some sort of awareness, almost functional, and then almost fall back. Almost like an experiment, huh? All, trillions of them. So our ancestry, our very basis, is this foundation. Think of a nail bed mm-hmm. with the nail sticking up. Mm-hmm. And it's everything's a failure except for one mm-hmm. that supports the next level. That's right. Oh, our ancestors. So I then... I mean, this is what it took for you to survive in the Hadean and to get to protocellular division and get to robustness and whoa. Then there's a feeling, there's a there's a embodied feeling, not not just of gratitude for being here. Existence. Just existence. This is existence. Like this is what it takes against the background of the torrent of physics is I'm on the Mar- a Mars landing site selection for the next rover. And we look at the conditions on Mars, I'm like, whoa, Mars went out of the habitable zone a billion years in, and it just died horribly. Venus went out, uh, you know, it died horribly. The oceans went into the atmosphere, and then... So we are in what is usually referred to the Goldilocks zone, yeah, right? Yeah. And just we, the right... And we stayed in it for biosphere. so long. Planets don't stay in the zone. In fact, Gaia, before Gaia is born, so... Lovelock's concept of Gaia. Here's life for three billion years attempting to work in this toxic environment to to survive and continue to evolve. It freezes over completely. The whole planet. Can you imagine? You know, and then it's it's reflecting sunlight, so it can't get warm, but volcanoes poke up and melt it. Massive asteroid impacts. All these 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 things. And then suddenly one day, um, there's enough biological matter to control the thermostat, finally. This temperature was never under control by life, and then, then life can maintain its Goldilocks conditions. So if there's a big blowout of CO2, it can sequester it, pull it into the plant bodies. So Gaia is born, and we're messing with Gaia right now. We are messing. We're messing with and Gaia. The way we are messing could lead to the next extinction. Yeah, well, we're... Did you know, here's a, here's a crazy fact. So plant, uh, 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 animal vertebrate biomass, mm-hmm. 5,000 BC, 98% of animal biomass, uh, 98% was wild animals and birds and, and fishes and stuff. We don't include insects because they're not vertebrates. Guess what it is now? What is it? It's completely flipped. So it's 98% livestock um, pets, humans, two percent is 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 wild bio uh, body biomass. Two percent. And this is a perfectly balanced ecosystem in a sense, homeostasis yeah. in a biological living planet, right? Well, we are don't, we the predator then? Well, we're what we've done. You know, this, we're in the Anthropocene, right? So we've yeah. gridded the planet, and our cities are new ecosystems. That's right. For coyotes and raccoons mm-hmm. and certain mm-hmm. types of birds, crows are having a field day. Chickens are the number one success in the animal kingdom. They started in Southeast Asia, and now there's a trillion of them because, because of their food for us. Yeah. But by by the rules of by the measure of the football game of mm-hmm. natural selection, they're the winners. Like they're the dominant species on the planet, a chicken, dominant animal, probably rats too, but. We can't measure those. Well, I, I, I heard once, and I'm not sure if it is true, uh, we're talking about, uh, somebody told me this, that uh, if insects disappeared from this planet, all life would cease in yeah, five years. Pretty quick. Yeah. And if humans disappeared from this planet, then life would flourish in yeah, five years. Totally. <laughs> so in a, in a way, a permanently victorious species like us, Yeah. Uh, risks its own extinction. Yeah, it does. Um, the, one of the examples for me is where I live in the California redwoods. Redwoods are the crown species of all trees. They, That's right. They, they're the most massive, long-lived, they're effectively eternal because mm-hmm. they grow new sprouts. 
but they're so successful that they're going extinct. Oh my god! So before even humans came along, redwoods redwoods used to be on six continents, and their success was built on high energy requirements and, and water. And guess what? Earth's past middle age. Earth is dying actively right now because the sun's on a heating curve, and now you have these belt deserts, north and south, and you have these terrible ice ages. We're in the late middle age of the planet. And according to Lovelock, we have 100 million years before we cross the Venus Terminator and flip to Venus conditions. So Gaia, if Gaia exists, is like, guys... Terminal uh, patient. Yeah, we're, yeah, the planet is, and it's nothing to do with greenhouse. We're accelerating it. But it's that stars are on these curves, and we are about to exit the habitable zone, and and it will happen rapidly. And it's a hundred million years. I mean, don't sell your real estate mm-hmm. just yet. But it's a it's a profound thought that we are in the last fraction of a percent of complex life on this world that took four point five billion years to arise, and complex life is only a little bump of two percent, and then we go to Venus conditions, and then we're it's a hot house with microbes in the in the crust until the sun consumes the earth. So uh, in the big picture thing, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility for what we've so been tell healing. me, now, what's the focus of your work right now? It's literally a combination of the science, I call it science and spirit. Because if we have a model for our ancestry, for how, for, for the gearheads on the planet. Without a single break in the chain of being, right? From the first living organism no. to right this moment? No, there's no break. There's I, no except break. in the progenian where there's false starts constantly. I see. Yeah, there's this prickly, difficult period. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, my, my goal is, from when I was 14 and I had this vision, I had no idea. I thought that by in my 50s I would actually have enough collaborations and enough experience and enough miracles and probability would shape that it would be a solution would rise and it did in my 50s and the rest of my life Deepak is going into the field doing the chemistry and hydrothermal systems supporting the empirical science as best I can raising money hopefully for our institute so we can fund all these researchers Uh, and then coming to places like this and meeting people like you to bring you this news. Well, you know, I'm now 71, and I'm trying to put together collaborative initiatives with people like you, but also hardcore reductionists, mm-hmm. philosophers, um, artists, musicians. I think if we... One disadvantage of being a specialist is you mm-hmm. have no idea You're right. what's happening outside right, your right. field. But you put people from disparate disciplines together, mm-hmm. you keep a system open and transparent, and you incubate together, yeah. emergence happens. Something yeah, emergence happens. Will happen. yeah. So what is your hope for the future my, for, with your work? With my work, here it is. Mm. Survival of the fittest, a term that was, was sort of browbeaten by Spencer, so that Darwin included it. In, in replacement of the much more neutral so, uh, natural selection in the later editions of Origin of Species, he didn't like it. It's a very Victorian idea. It led to terrible social Darwinism and problems in India, everywhere, in the yeah. colonial world, everywhere. Survival of the fittest, because it's a, it's a separation. It's a statement of separation. It led to all kinds of bad behavior. We can roll this out of our culture now. Survival of the wisest um, oh becomes no. the new criterion for mm-hmm. evolution? No, here it is. It's even more simple. In our model, which could be proven chemically, there was never a single individual at the origin. It was a community. It was a, a mass of simpler protocells cooperating. It was the only possible way. So the unit of evolution is a community that collaborates, not individuals in competition. Eventually you do get, you know, humans compete, but we're actually mostly collaborative. Our cities are collaborative creations. So the unit, the, the ancestor is a collaborative community, and that can roll into, into our entire... The collaborative community <coughs> in the one mind, in the one consciousness, or I think how do you think of it? Well... 
If, are we kind of differentiated from a single we are an outgrowth. unified we are an outgrowth and deeply connected into a massive network so at the <clears throat> this goes back to your original question so i would say what we've found is the actual physical chemical basis for the thing that supports the conscious field mm -hmm. in total unity and it's based upon sharing and collaboration and the most powerful force in the universe, the ability to shape future probability, which life is really good at and physics is not good at. So in, in 13 billion years of cosmic evolution, if you took the universe and gave it a grade, it would get a C. Because it's like, what it, 13 billion years you just produced these types of stars and this periodic table and a bunch of minerals and dust. Um, you're not very productive because it's a two-phase cycling thing. But when life comes in, there's memory, and then you have emergence possible. Where is the memory? Uh, it's everywhere. So it can start, you know, for the gearheads among us, it starts with short little oligos of templates, poly polymer templates, which are still running in our bodies. But then information is everywhere. So what we're doing here and what we're doing with the audience, we're crowding ourselves together so that we increase the probability of miraculous things. Then we're communicating about it. Then we, we make a memory. We're making this recording. And then others take this recording and they, they evolve further. And that's the proposal I made yesterday. Which is emergence, isn't it? That these are the three cycling things that drive emergence. Probability drives interconnection, interactivity, which drives the writing of memory, which drives more probability. And is it all spontaneous, self-organizing? It's, it's, it's this. It's this. Cycles. Cycles, turning and turning and turning and turning. Cycles of time. Cycles, yeah. Cycles of time, time. In the timeless. Matter in the timeless, yeah. Cycles of time in the timeless. Yes, beautifully like said. So, Bruce, um, do you get uh, a lot of uh, backlash from reductionists, materialists? Not particularly, Because no. you're well, very comfortable there. Yeah. Uh, if I'm in front of that audience, I wear a different outfit <laughs> and I use different language. That's right. I, I reskin because part of my training, Deepak, is because I can realm. My consciousness can realm. Like the other night, I was feeling you. I was feeling your system to get to know you. And then we met at dinner last That's night. That's right. And it was a beautiful connection. Yeah, it was great. It was great, yeah. Okay. So, so, uh, so if you're in a reductionist audience, mm -hmm. what you do is you load their OS and become them. Because they're expecting a certain level of, of discourse. Yeah, otherwise, and you're not communicating. You're not communicating. And you're, you're a realm person, too. I mean, I, I watch... Yeah, but I get a lot of backlash. But, but strict where... Strict reductionist physicalists, I get a lot of backlash. But where it counts in your individual relationship with people, I watched the line after yeah. your talk. Yeah. And every person that was coming up, your system was completely coming out to meet them. Yeah, you course. were giving them full attention. Yeah. It was beautiful. Well, it, feels, yeah. it feels good to be connected. Yeah. What will we find if we go to your website? Um, it's a sort of a Wikipedia. I don't even have a Wikipedia entry, but it's a Wikipedia style thing. Mm -hmm. uh, a picture of me in a suit and a picture of me in festival performance gear. <laughs> so you can see the variations. A link to the Levity Zone podcast, which is my personal diary, which I'm hoping more people listen to. I will. I'm going to become a fan. So um, there's a lot of room for us to collaborate as, Wonderful. as the next few years unroll. I'm um, focusing on creating this um, collaborative. Around emergence, around, right? Around emergence globally. 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 Yeah. With uh, a lot of help from philanthropists and mm -hmm. other people who want to see emergence um, accelerated in a way. Yeah. And that's I think a beautiful that's mission. To, to that's great. have yeah. that emergence accelerate, we need it's, people It's an like emergence to, emergency. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or else we're doomed. So please check out uh, the website. Um, uh, that's uh, damer.com. Damer.com. D-A-M-E-R. -E yeah, it's right here. And, um, and uh, this will be, of course, online now. And I'll tweet the link and uh, we'll continue this conversation it's uh, been a very uh, enlightening experience for me thank you and thank i'm you. very grateful that you 
drop by to have this conversation. No, I'm, I'm, and, I'm honored. And Thank now you. this conversation is going global. So Hello. <laughs> thanks to our supporters. Uh, it is going uh, global and thanks to all of you. So until next time. Thank you. And uh, Bruce, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Blessings. Blessings. <laughs> Catch up with your Dr. Bruce's ongoing life on the page for this episode, number 65, at www.levityzone.org, where I will link in the full video for the Facebook Live session with Deepak, and also our recently published Vesicles in Yellowstone paper, and my sand talk. Thanks go to Christoph for joining the Levity Zone editor team and not only helping clean up the audio for this episode, but making great podcast cover art featuring Deepak and me making our connection. If you have an audience or someone you feel I should connect with in Facebook Live or any other newfangled social media widget, please let me know. It was fun. Reach out to me through my contact page on my personal site at www.damer.com. And see you next time in the Levity Zone.